second. All right, we're live. Welcome everyone on behalf of the McCall Center in Charlotte. This is our final of four talks, which has been happening based on the exhibition, Dwell, Pause for Thought, Investigating the Process of Printmaking. It's up on the third floor of the McCall. Please check it out up there till around December 15th. Um, like I said, this is our fourth talk. There are eight um, exhibiting artists in the exhibition. Um, all of these four videos are gonna be available on the McCall website, the brand new app, YouTube, and Facebook. So this evening for our last talk, um, we've got this uh, infamous trio of Canadians suddenly coming together. Um, we've got Emma Nishimura and Erica Walker. Thanks to you both for joining us for the exhibition and this evening. Hello. Um, the game plan tonight is to allow each artist to uh, say whatever the heck they want, roughly, for, for 10 minutes, talking a little bit about maybe their background, their works in progress, um, what they have done, what their work's all about. And kind of like the other talks, we did focus quite a bit on individual techniques. So quite a few people were selected for this exhibition based on what they are prime examples of. And tonight is no different for that. So roughly 10, uh, 10 minutes per artist, give or take, and then we'll jump in with some banter and some questions. Anything you two wanna clarify before we get going? <laughs> No, nothing. no. Well, I'm not. Yes, I will say I'm not. Uh, I'm not really Canadian. I. This is my. <gasps> I, I had a sneaking suspicion, but I was going to let you slide with that. <laughs> I wonder why you suspected that. Either CV. my work or my accent. I C CV analysis. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Let's. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> if you don't mind, Emma, I'd love to begin with you. Um, I know you're currently based in the amazing city of Toronto, where I also once um, lived. Um, you're an assistant professor and chair of photography, printmaking, and publications at OCAD U, the Ontario College of Art and Design University. You got to spell it all out, right? Mm -hmm. So among your many notable accomplishments, there are many, because I'm like teeming through the, uh, the CV and I'm like, okay, 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 I love this. Um, 2018, the Queen Sonia Print Award, that's definitely a big highlight. Um, you've got work in permanent collections in the Royal Ontario Museum, the Japanese Canadian National Museum, and the Library of Congress, just to note a few of them. Emma, thank you for joining us this evening, and I would love if you wouldn't mind um, kicking us off with what you're all about. Yeah, absolutely. First off, um, a big thank you to, um, to Miles for uh, curating the show and and a really big thank you to the McCall for hosting. Um, I wish that I could see this work in person. This list of artists involved uh, was really exciting to see come together and I so wish I could be there in person. Um, yes, currently I am in my basement studio in Toronto. Um, my children are screaming on the floor above me, so I hope you don't hear them. Um, yeah, I would say kind of for the last 15 years now. Um, my practice has really been about looking at my family's history. Um, so I'm half Japanese Canadian, half Scottish Canadian, but very Canadian kind of on both sides. Um, and so really I've been looking at the history of uh, kind of my grandparents' history and, um, and the extended uh, Japanese Canadian history. So my grandparents were both interned during the war as Japanese Canadian. Um, Growing up, we heard some of those stories, uh, but there was a lot of silence. Um, we didn't hear a lot of details. And I think when I was a kid, we would kind of sit around the table and my mom, the daughter-in-law would ask questions, but uh, my sister and I didn't ever feel like we could ask questions. And um, it wasn't until uh, about five years after my grandmother's death that um, I found this old box of sewing patterns. Um, and in it were these um, sheets of notebook paper and she was making, found out we, she was making clothes for other people um, when she was in the camps. Um, so that really kind of got my work focused thinking about my grandparents' history specifically. Um, and then over the years, it's been um, about kind of the broader uh, Japanese Canadian experience. And so some of the works that we're looking at right now and the works that are in the show um, are using traditional Japanese wrapping uh, known as a furoshiki. So you take a square of cloth and you can wrap up um, anything. You can wrap up your lunch, you can wrap up, uh, it can be very utilitarian. It can also be used for giving gifts. 
Um, and so it has a really long history, uh, about 1200 years, I think. Um, and now kind of in its contemporary state, uh, it's very much kind of associated with gift giving. And uh, in Japanese culture to give an unwrapped gift is, is, in, is considered impolite. And so I've been thinking about kind of these, this box of patterns I inherited, as well as all these old photographs I inherited. And over the years, kind of the weight of the weight of history that I've been carrying around and kind of the feeling of, um, I think, responsibility to share that story uh, and that sense of urgency, I think, now in these days when so many of those who were interned, um, there's not really a lot of them left. Um, so feeling like I need to record oral histories and, and talk to people. Um, but it's also been about the generations after those who were interned. Um, so looking at kind of the reverberations through history of what memories get passed on, what doesn't, um, and kind of how do we negotiate those boundaries of, of memory and history. And, you know, in the context of current day, the current day world, um, of watching as all of these people are displaced, kind of how do we wrap our hand, wrap our brains around all of that? Um, my work is also very process based. Um, so I've been kind of specifically the work that we're looking, images we're looking at right now are of um, making handmade paper. Um, so the work that's in the show at the McCall consists of um, several dozen furoshiki, all made of handmade paper. Um, so for those of you who've made paper before, you blend the pulp for maybe 40 minutes. Um, I'm using a sculptural paper making technique where you um, mix the pulp for about five or six hours. So the fibers get really, really short. Um, so we make the pulp and I'm collaborating with a paper making studio in Toronto called Paper House. Um, so we mix the pulp and then we form the sheets of paper, which you can see in this image on the right. Um, and then I don't let anything dry. I bring home all the sheets wet. Um, and then I print, you can go to the next slide. Um, I print onto that damp paper, a uh, photo etching. And so this is, these are all photographs of my grandparents, um, of their time when they were interned and kind of the years on either yeah. side of that. Uh, and then once I print onto, so it's a, this is a photo etching that I've done on a piece of copper. Um, and then you can go to the next slide. Um, and then here is this furoshiki wrap. So I take this, this print on a square of damp paper and I wrap it around a mold of sand. Um, and then as the paper is drying, it shrinks because those fibers are so short because it's been in the beater for so long. Um, and then what's really interesting is, is it dries so crisply that you can't ever untie it. Um, so I fold it around this mold of sand and then I drain out all the sand. So these look really heavy um, but they weigh nothing and you can't ever untie it. And depending on how you wrap it, and you can go to the next slide, um, different, um, or maybe go back, <laughs> we're jumping ahead too far. Um, kind of depending on how you wrap those those forms, different parts of the image are highlighted and other, um, others are hidden. So I would say kind of a through line of my work is really about, um, accessibility, about how much the viewer can see, about how much the viewer can't. It's about sharing these stories and this history, but also acknowledging how challenging it is to access, um, both for those who experienced it in terms of sharing those stories, um, because there's been so much silence associated with it, um, and kind of then those subsequent generations of how much has been um, passed on. Um, so these prints, so in 20, uh, 19, uh, I was able to go to Sweden and work with um, Atelier Larsson. Um, this was part of the Queen Sonia Print Award. I was able to do this residency where we got to work with a lot of very large photopolymer plates. Um, and so this series um, was really looking at using photo documentation of those sculptural pieces. And I was interested in, you know, continuing this idea of, you know, how do we pass on memory? So, um, a lot of my work looks at, uses um, kind of for reference, this idea of post-memory, um, a theory developed by Marion Hirsch uh, and kind of that really looks at how traumatic memories are passed on to different generations and they become kind of these inherited memories and experiences. Um, so for these pieces, um, 
that then become this flat representation. I was thinking about process, but also kind of these process intimately connected with the work. So these ones started off as an original photograph, then turned into a photo etching, then turned into a sculpture, then turned into a digital documentation of that sculpture, which then turned into another photo etching. And kind of interested in these these different generations of, of an image. Um, this piece that the sculpture you can pick up, which you were always limited, you could never open it and see the whole photograph. In this iteration, these ones, um, this is called Generations of an Archive, I believe, if I remember. Um, you can no longer pick up those sculptures. You can't ever turn them around. You can only ever see them from one perspective. Um, so kind of through time, these stories get kind of flattened and we get more and more removed from those details. Um, so, yeah, I would say a lot of my practice and the way I approach the work becomes pretty circular too. I often return to images and work through them and then see what the next step brings, um, kind of that winding path. That's pretty fun. I know I'm not supposed and, to ask questions yet, but I'm doing it anyhow. I'm sorry. Yeah. So you, okay. you um, reuse and reinvestigate imagery in a way that I feel like I do quite a bit as well. Like I'm not done mm -hmm. with something, but I choose yeah. a different print mm -hmm. process to further investigate it. It's, mm -hmm. I think that's the only way you can thoroughly explore an idea and an investigation of your big ideas, which you're not through yet. Um, yeah, totally. That's and when how you it works just in my brain. <laughs> process to process to process to, to back. Mm -hmm. Are you worried about the loss of imagery or the loss of memory that also would happen with that transition? Absolutely. And I think that's such a huge part of navigating this space of memory. And and there's so much loss along the way. Um, so to really be able to talk about that through process of making it feels so inherent to to the conceptual ideas that I'm exploring. Um, and I think just to, you know, always every decision is very purposeful. Um, and you can come, jump to the next slide and then I'll pass it over to Erica. So I've done a series called Collective Stories. And so in these pieces, um, I'm interviewing different Japanese Canadians and um, then kind of recording that oral history and then transcribing it. And so carrying along this idea of the furoshiki, um, but then um, creating an etching of transcribed text, really. I discovered a while ago that I could write really small. So um, that's an odd skill I have. Um, and I love to do tiny, meticulous things. So um, these pieces, in this series, kind of, I see each one is really a portrait of different from a different storyteller, and interviewing people from different generations. This is my aunt, um, so kind of this acknowledgement of these absent spaces of um, of what doesn't ever get filled in. There's so much that we don't know. I wanted to share this image because the image on the right gives a uh, close example of how it's currently set up. I believe you have five shelves at the McCall. Um, do you have any anything you could quickly mention about um, having like the solo hovering pieces? Because they stand alone. They completely stand alone as a singular piece. But there's this weird transformation, which is really kind of challenging when you've got them all in a row systematically mm -hmm. or in a grid formation with the flatter mm -hmm. pieces. Is there anything, um, I don't know what I'm asking. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, in terms of the installation, it's, it's been a it's a it's still in progress so to date i think i've made about 450 of them um i'm in the midst of you know hoping for some grants to come through that really the the vision is to make thousands of them um so that you can walk into a space and be fully surrounded by them um right now this archive is really still using my family's photos so this feels like this archive of my own family's that's you know very you know and there's other people in them that obviously connects to the wider Japanese Canadian experience, but I would really, I want to make this archive be more reflective of the wider um, JC experience. Um, so, you know, to kind of continue this community engagement. And that's been a big, really important part for me over the years of, of engaging with that community. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And I can go on, but I think we should pass it over. Well, we'll definitely be coming back because I've got like six questions just kind of formulating in my head. Um, we'll move on. Ah, oh, 
Erica, hello. <laughs> Hi, Miles. Hi, Erica. Um, an associate professor of art at the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. I've got family there. I haven't seen them in a long time. Mm, come on by. Here. I need to go. Um, you were recently featured in the 2022 exhibition about Landfall Press, Five Decades mm -hmm. of Printmaking at the Knoxville Museum of Art in Tennessee. I had the pleasure of just on my way to um, Murray State University mm. stopping in, in Knoxville. And it was such a joy that that exhibition was on. Mm. Um, it was pretty fantastic to walk around that space. Um, they also published a beautiful catalog. Um, I'm hoping you have one of those having been in the yeah. exhibition. I would like one. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, you received the Mid-Career Artist Award at SGC in 2023. I think they need to retitle that. Mm. The whole mid-career part. I was like, I don't know how I feel about that, but congrats on that Me award. Me neither. Fund. Me neither, Miles. Yeah. Southern Graphic Council International, for those of you who don't know. Next one coming up is in Rhode Island, Providence, yeah. um, in April. Um, you also received the Best in Show from the Okanagan Print Triennial, which I find mm -hmm. like, that's such a good print um, exhibition, and numerous other grants. I just stopped counting and, and looking at them because there were just so many. So impressive. Thank you for spending your time and your evening with us. Absolutely. This is, yeah, this is great. Miles, thank you. Um, and thank you for that introduction to this, this new work of yours, Emma. That was beautiful. Um, but, but back to you again, Miles. Thank you for including us in this exhibition. I wish I could have been there. Um, the documentation looks great. And yeah, all of the, all of the things from my end have been lovely and smooth and yeah, just wish we could have all been together. <laughs> Um, and the work that is in the exhibition, I think, with the exception of that landfall piece that you saw, um, this is kind of the first time I'm publicly exhibiting this work. It's really new. It's very much in progress. Um, if you have questions about it that you were going to cover, I may or may not be able to answer some of them, which is a lovely, it's a, it's a lovely space to be, to be, yeah, you know, to be mid-career and making artwork that I don't, I don't know if this is any good. Um, I, I feel strongly about it. Um, I'm, I'm into it for the moment. Um, I, uh, there's so many interesting parallels, I think, between my work and Emma's, but huge contrasts as well, obviously. Um, in, in the aesthetic and material way that we that we work through things, but also um, the the similarities have to do with you know wondering if I may if I may Emma wondering uh, what kinds of what kind of residues are left in in us what kind of um, in what ways have those stories of our predecessors our ancestors been handed down um, and how, yeah, how do we grapple with that and question that and, and provide visual and material, uh, cultural evidence of, of what that is. I think that's a, a bit of a studio question of mine or, or where a lot of the poster work began. Um, and you can skip ahead to. Yeah. Do you want to look at posters those. first? Those yeah. Yards, yeah. Let, yeah. There we go. Yeah. So you could just rest there. It's funny what you picked. Um, oh, is it? So I thought yeah, I'm like, no, once I gravitated towards, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's always interesting to see what what people, <laughs> what are what are other people's favorites. Um, the the bulk of my practice in the last decade or so has been um, has been making these lithographic posters. I put posters in quotations because they don't they don't really function like a poster. I mean, a poster's entire entire um, you know, purpose is to deliver a very clear message quickly. Um, and these do not do that. They, they sort of situate themselves in between agitation propaganda and integration propaganda, which was the, the French philosopher Jacques Ellul. That was his like two definitions of the two types of propaganda. Integration propaganda was about convincing people of the benefits of adjusting themselves to desired ways of being, thinking, uh, patterns of behavior, and then agitation propaganda or agitprop was was about you know inciting, inciting divergent thinking and rebellion, and so between those two modes, there's no persuasion happening here. Um, 
and and what I'm doing with these posters, at least for myself, um, it began as this this interest in starting to unpack some of my some of my heritage, my birthrights, my the, you know the legacies of my ancestors, um, of of which, unlike Emma's, um, there was no silence. It's all around me all the time. Um, you know, since since before I was forming memories. I'm I've been a little troubled lately at how my my son is coming home. Uh, he had a he had a poppy sticker on the other day uh, for Veterans Day or Remembrance Day or whatever we call it here in Canada. Remembrance Day. He comes home singing the national anthem of Canada. Um, had it been the American national anthem, I think I would have felt similarly strange. Um, but but suffice it to say, we're just inundated from very early age in, in these stories about, um, about patriotism, national identity, um, civic ideals. And in graduate school, particularly, I started really wondering, um, yeah, why, why, how is it that I feel so much pride um, and so much frustration, shame, uh, confusion all around the same stories of uh, of my families. So, I and I think, and this is a a bit of a connection with the work that's up at the McCall right now. I think a lot of it began um, as a child listening to my father talk, because you know, unlike Emma, there wasn't a lot of silence. He was he talked a lot. <laughs> he wrote a lot. He was a syndicated columnist, <laughs> um, and he was a he was a teacher. And that he was constantly talking about topics that I think at the time when it came to his service in Vietnam or militarism in general, uh, current events, politics, you know, what I heard was this very strident person. But then in some of his writings and some of the things that him and I spoke about privately, uh, particularly the conversations that we had after watching um, mash in the evenings at 9 p.m. Central Time. We would have he would we would have conversations. He would tell me um, what he thought about the episode, and and he was like, I think he was sloughing off some internal some internal stuff, some of his own uh, baggage in these really subtle ways. And so since he he died at a pretty young age, um, I ended up I think in my adult life wishing I could piece those conversations back together and even debate him a bit. Cause I think he was also wrong about a lot of stuff. Um, so it's anyway, back to the posters it's I'm grappling with, um, with these heritage stories, these stories where there's some of the most, I think some of the most proud um, and beautiful stories coexist right alongside some of the most shameful things that, that my predecessors have, have ever done. Um, and those opposing truths are, are at once always real and there's a lot of space in between. And I'm interested in using my studio practice to, to explore that complexity and that space in between. Um, not in, never really in service of, of you know, saying, hey, there's a lot of gray area, it's messy, it's complicated, let's, let's just leave it there. But in hopes of uh, inspiring some critical thinking, um, showing us and uh, yeah, showing viewers that if you can recognize or feel or experience a little bit of, a little bit of stirring patriotism, but also a stirring of criticality or um, it's that little those, gray area you mentioned, and they're ta you're yeah. taking you know, like a little marble each time. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, that that if you can feel both of those things, that that maybe you'll see some implication. Maybe you'll see yourself as part of a solution and a problem. Um, that's certainly where where I end up resting with it. Um, anyway, I'm a oh, there we go. Uh, and now being in Canada. Um, I'm looking at, you know, since I moved here, kind of looking at some of those parallel stories 
um, not not even just with militarism, but uh, resource extraction, um, what it means to be to be a settler here. Um, and how do I, yeah, how do I start to understand my place on this continent, um, the privilege that I've been growing up with? How can I explore? I use my studio practice to kind of explore those stories even further, to, to fill all the gaps and the holes in my, in my history, um, what I don't remember from history class in, in high school, which is a lot. So it's, it's, I'm like the pseudo art historian or, or historian of um, national, regional identity. Would, would you mind touching on why, why you're choosing lithography as your mm. medium? Not all the time, but a, a lot mm. of your work, and especially posters, there are lots of good reasons to be using litho for poster work. Um, wh yeah. Why have you gravitated towards that? And if you don't mind, I'm going right back to that image. Close your eyes again, everyone. <laughs> there we go. Uh. Um, they don't understand, I think, quite a few people like that. I was talking with artists, uh, sorry, um, random visitors at the McCall Center during the mm -hmm. opening. And for 20 minutes, we're talking about the process of litho in front of your work. Mm -hmm. And hearing both, like looking at the work, understanding what's happening in it conceptually, and then understanding the process that goes through to make those prints is a completely different conversation. Mm -hmm. And so when people learn that, um, they just lit up completely lit up and then it became like oh my gosh and then they hovered longer dare i say they dwelled longer to look at the exhibition nice that was really bad but sorry please nice. <laughs> or really good i don't know <laughs> um you do i don't know there was something about the way you just said that miles that i realized um there is a almost like a gaping chasm between all of the things that happen on the front end, all yeah. of the the textual things that I'm reading, all of the documents and reports and speeches and, you know, all of the historic sites that I'm visiting and um, articles of my father's that I'm reading. And then, and all the graphic artwork that I'm looking at from especially early 20th century, like European and uh, North American integration propaganda. I just graphic art generally look at that all the time. Um, and then this, this physical part of my practice, like where all that work starts to manifest into, into discrete artworks. And they're very, they're very different. Like for me, there's a, there's a, obviously a path that feels quite um, smooth at this point. Um, but when I talk about process and when I remember what, you know, what drawing on that stone at landfall press was like and what, um, what I really get excited about in the making of work is is very it's it's a bit removed I think from that more that more research based work. So lithography because um, because it just seemed like it seemed like the right tool for the job because the work that I was looking at the work that the graphic historical work um, that existed in the the First World War and the Second World War was often done lithographically. Um, and in the case of, especially of France, Belgium, um, and Germany in World War I, at least, those posters were, were done on stones, mm -hmm. um, which is amazing to think about, that that was the, quick, <laughs> that was the quickest way of producing propaganda uh, in the early 20th century. Um, it, it's the right tool for the job, but also there's nothing sexier than drawing on a stone. As far as drawing surfaces are concerned, I don't know, maybe Emma finds like tiny type to be really alluring. But for me, there's something about that surface. Um, hey, hold hold that thought. That's going to be one of my questions yeah. in a oh, bit. <laughs> okay. I won't, I won't go too far down that way. I, I, it's not my, it's not my favorite medium, honestly. Um, there's something, especially because my first love was in Talio, um, and and I love the physicality of relief. I like the the physical charm. This is the size of relief work that is behind me that I've been working on lately, um, and they're you know fairly large for prints. And the the physical kind of juggling act of working on them um, is really really suits me and that has to do with my history in in manual labor fields 
but or just part of who I am. Maybe that's why I gravitated towards manual labor, and well, maybe manual that's why I labor and and litho to me go go hand in hand. Like there's like I call it yeah. print gym for a reason. Like you're not going to the print studio to relax. It is print gym. It is. It is. It is. But there's something about the the seductive quality of a stone. I do a lot of drawings on films. And then even the surface quality of a finished lithograph, there's a smoothness to that. There's a, there's a softness often to it, even though the works I make are very graphic and bold. There's something less physical. There's a different kind of physicality, I guess, than intaglio or relief where, um, where the pressure can really end up affecting the surface quality of the paper where embossment is is a frequent a frequent bedfellow for uh, for context with this print right here which i know is produced at um at landfall mm -hmm. um, so looking back at like emma's photopolymers they were roughly one fourth like that's a full sheet i'm guessing uh four times there give or take and emma's would have taken up one quarter with lots of white space so just to help people get a little bit of scale i mm. think i'm right but they've pieced four pieces together, Josh Osborne. Mm -hmm. A while um, Yeah. So yeah, Josh, Josh, um, what a task he had to do to tile those together. They were 30 by 40, like kind of over, I think what we call oversized sheets. So 30 by 40 okay. inch sheets that were tiled, tiled together. Um, yeah, yeah. What a trip. I really then, wanted this one in the exhibition, but the framing costs. I'm like, no, we can't do this. We're not. This isn't happening. <laughs> I don't blame you, and I wouldn't want to ship that to you. Um, hmm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. I didn't mean to cut you off. Wherever. Um, um, did you want me to jump into some questions for you all? Yeah. That sound like a game plan. Oh, sure. ooh, all right. Mm -hmm. um, so where to start, where to start? Um, archives. So imagery from the past with relevant connections to today is very clear in both of your work. Um, could you both comment on the chosen inventory of imagery that you have and why you've paired it with photopolymer or why you've paired it with litho? So we, we kind of fleshed out a little bit of that about the litho, but Process to concept is always um, something I challenge my students with a lot. Mm. Like, why are you making that decision to work that scale with that process versus mm. this one? And they usually freeze up and have to think a little bit about that. What are your What are your thoughts mm. on process versus concept? Mm. <laughs> um, I think for for the sculptural for Oshiki project, it was it was also like lots of practical considerations. Um, I needed to print on a damp sheet of paper to make this work. Um, and so Intaglio makes the most sense for that, um, to be able to do this. Uh, I, you know, I worked with the Furoshiki form on loose paper before and, and it was interesting explorations, but it was only until I really figured out this paper making process that things all started to come together. Um, so then it was this kind of perfect marriage between um, photo intaglio and paper making. And that uh, process. the desire to have so much control that you have to make your own paper, where does that come from? That's really because of this sculptural aspect of it. Um, okay. I mean, in all my other paper, I happily buy all of, I, you know, for the most part, all of my etchings are printed on Japanese paper and I um, I'm beyond grateful that I live in Toronto with the Japanese paper place so close by. Yes. Um, so. Uh, you physically yeah, needed I, those shorter fibers. I get mm -hmm, it now. Mm -hmm, got, it. Mm -hmm. got it. Got it. Got it. To make this, to make these things. So um, yeah, that was, you know, kind of, that's a unique thing where it's like, it has to be this. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah. Intaglio is, I would say, kind of my first love of print, and it's often how I think, and then that impacts how I conceive of the works. Um, so I can't really tease them out anymore between kind of it being, you know, for most things, it's like, well, no, it just has to be an etching. This is like, I need to, part of the tactility of it, part of, you know, I remember doing 
photography in undergrad and printing it out digitally and even in grad school printing things out and being like oh okay it's just I need to get my hands in there I need to get my hands in there um, give me that etching press so, yeah and like let me cut up let me cut it up and put it back together and um and kind of get in there so I think uh it's been learning how I work and and then that you know that's maybe how I first arrived at these processes but then these processes are now informing the work that I make and how I think about making work too mm. um, mm. circular <laughs> <laughs> um anything you want to add to that Erica or yeah well it the the work that's up at the McCall um is the first time I'm using specifically uh fam like family archives um I use a lot of public yeah public archives uh photographs from visits to museums and all of the the sort of memorial sites where there are often huge pieces of artillery just sitting there as part of a memorial like next to the stone where the you know where the text is etched in some granite marble and then there's just this massive piece of artillery um, what a way, what a weird way that we commemorate, <laughs> um, field trips, lots of museum field trips, uh, sometimes the internet, you know, there's, there's usually a story with the poster works, like a story behind the machines that I tend to use that is, is the basis for this exploration into all of the multifaceted little chunks of, of, um, of historical complexity. But then these works, um, really the first time I'm using the figure um, and depicting depicting people who are uh, in you know intimately involved in um, in service like in military service that's not, never something I was comfortable with before um, but I, I started digging into my father's all of his slides from his service in Vietnam and really finding these images of uh, flight deck work to be really compelling um, and reminiscent of all the ways that the male body has been used in in propaganda, particularly to extol the virtues of of this very limited version of masculinity, the way that it's packaged in 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 propaganda and and in contemporary propaganda as well. Something I didn't really mention earlier was playing around in the past and the early to mid 20th century is also an exercise in realizing um, how much, how little has changed mm -hmm. actually. Like it's really easy to kind of scoff and laugh at the stuff that my grandparents would have looked at, you know, to, to garner support for war efforts, but really the tactics, the visuals things have changed a bit, but the tactic tactics used to persuade people are really very much the same. Um, so anyway, I'm using these, yeah, these photographs of, um, these photographs my dad took on the flight deck of an aircraft carrier in the South China Sea in a little spot called Yankee Station outside of um, outside of Vietnam, uh, where he launched uh, he launched planes to wow. yeah to go like bomb bomb the hell out of um, South Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia as well. Um, so there's they're, yeah, they're just very, they're loaded photographs. I've removed all of the, um, all of the artifice around them, the, the jets, the carrier itself, and just sort of focused on these, these bodies that are just men, they're men at work in an attempt to kind of isolate that. I, I wanted to answer your question more directly, but. Um, it's not always possible. Are. Here we are. It's not always <laughs> possible. Um, you, you both brought this up before, the idea of meticulous qualities, precision, registration, labor-intensive print-based processes, which clearly appeal to both of you. And I think that's a, a general printmaker trait. Like we, we like to put ourselves through the ringer a little bit as much as the print in terms of what the print can do. Um, what am I asking here? Um, so... Erica, you have access, for example, to the master printer, Tamarin trained Jill Graham. Um, having that as a resource when making your work is phenomenal. That like, I'm like, I will steal her if I, if I could. And Emma, I'm curious about how you would operate in a studio process in terms of 
community studio access? Um, do you work with people as well to make your work? Um, because printmaking is a, a community sport. That's another thing I say a lot. It's not like painting, it's not like drawing, it's a shared studio space. I'd love to hear both of your comments about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, do I work with other So the prints that I made in Sweden, that was the first time I was really, um, so these ones, yeah, there was a suite of nine um, kind of smaller ones and then two kind of very large, large ones. Um, that was the first time I had other people print my work for me. It was um, a very interesting experience of mm -hmm. just kind of giving over um, and giving over that permission and that um, all of that. But uh, so that was a that was yeah that was a learning curve. Um, I just did a visiting artist residency a couple of weeks ago at Smith College um, and was able to work with have students print work and um have different faculty members and technicians and it was a really lovely collaborative experience um you know mixed in with teaching people how to wipe a plate and here you go um but it's you know those sorts of, you know there's all these different opportunities um but some of them too it's very can be very performative um kind of being a teacher uh working at ocad um you're you know performing all day and so much of what I love is then to come home and hide out in my basement and work for hours and focus and and stop out all the other noise. Right. Um, so I think it's been about trying to find a balance between that and knowing when to ask for help and you know depending on how big a project is going kind of when to bring in others um, but mm -hmm. then also knowing that so much of this is how I ground myself and kind of recharge and um, kind of I'm able to be in my own head and think through things. So I think it's, yeah, it's kind of accessing the kind of what print can offer, um, but also trusting in myself and knowing what I need and trying to, mm. you know, for as best as I can, trying to ne negotiate that. Balance. Did you find that you increased your edition number when you had assistance offered for you? <laughs> oh, uh... Yes and no. I mean, some of that's like set by other people, others. It's like, you're going to do this project for me? Amazing. What kind of an addition do you want to do? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, I'm, yeah, my additions are always kind of small, but everything takes forever because after yeah. I print it, then I'm like waxing it and then I'm cutting it all up and gluing it together. So mm. it's kind of the multi-step thing. But Right. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's something I really was really drawn to about your practice, Emma. And, and I think one of the first times I heard you speak about it, um, I, I, that really resonated with me, that idea of kind of moving from these very good public and social communal spaces back, you know, back to that quiet private studio and how important that having those two worlds operating um, has always been for me. Um, Cause yeah, everything that, that, you've been making, I think, in the last 10, 15 years involves so much, um, I think sometimes very painstaking care and focus. And, and I see a similar drive in myself to at least set myself up with things that are really um, time consuming <laughs> as an excuse for me. And it, this makes it sound very like hedonistic in some ways as an excuse for me to just shut everything else out like oh well I have to carve like a thousand little marks this week because it's part of my practice it's like, big, and I... <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. uh, so I need that time and I need everything else to bugger off so that I can um, have that peace and and um, but then that social the social part the community sport, as you called it, I love that, <laughs> is so fulfilling and so enriching. Yeah. Um, it really fills me up. It also wears me out. And then working with other people, having them print your work is this whole other dimension that um, I never really thought about it much. I, I don't, I don't want to say I don't care for it, but it does make me uneasy in some ways. Other people expending labor over my work. So when Jill, if Jill prints lithographically for me, it almost, especially at first, um, and in working with landfall folks too, with Steve and, and Josh, 
um, like they're over there sweating and working really hard. And um, that was supposed to be my job. There was almost a bit of pride wrapped up in that. Like I do everything. Um, I want those calluses. I want that yeah. back pain tomorrow morning. <laughs> right, right. So I think, yeah, giving giving up a little bit of that um, at first was really awkward and uncomfortable. But I'm really I got I got used to it. If Jill is printing my work, it means I can do I can do this project. I can do these carvings. I can work on two bodies of work simultaneously. Like, oh. of course, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Um, Emma, could I jump back to you for a second? Um, so your work, obviously, like we said before, speaks to an archive, but how has working with the publishing side at OCAD affected your ideas and your way of creating? I would only assume that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the process of simply adding another layer, um, it, it probably adds another layer uh, or like a stronger pillar to your original ideas, working with publishing and this like rememory of work that you have in your own personal kind of way of documentation. Has it been useful or has it been really frustrating with your practice kind of balancing both roles? I think, um, you know, so we recently merged our printmaking program with publications. Um, Eric can speak very eloquently to it all now. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I think it was, there's so much history within publications of using similar uh, machines um, and, you know, for different purposes. Um, I think, I don't know that that merger and how I'm thinking about kind of what print and pub can do has changed my work so much. Mm. Um, Maybe it hasn't at all. I was just like, yeah. oh, I see possible connections that could be rooted there. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. I think I'm one day I would love to make a book of some sort. There's there's so much history that I'm collecting and so many folks that I'm talking to that it would be really lovely to make something that's maybe a little bit more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, so many, you know, but it's a fine line. And so I had this wonderful um kind of talk event um, at a show I had a couple of months ago, working like a, a talk specifically with the Japanese Canadian community. And um, we were really talking about the care that we need to take with different people's stories. Mm -hmm. And how do people feel about having their stories shared? So I think kind of further to, you know, yes, it's that like, I, I love these small text pieces, but it's also to protect those stories and to protect that storyteller. Um, so I think, you know, I've always can thought about, you know, if if I do something that's a little bit more accessible or you share parts of those stories, it's, it's making sure that the storyteller is okay with that being shared. Because mm. um, it's one thing to take a magnifying glass to these pieces and spend some time and, and take away these little excerpts. Um, but it's a whole other thing to have your words published. Um, right. in a different kind of a way. So, right. um, you know, it's just different things that I, you know, think about, but those are kind of maybe more like longer term things. I think it's um, the accessibility aspect that you touched on that was probably mm -hmm. the most intriguing for me mm -hmm. like this. Like I have so many mixed opinions with um, uh, handbound artist books versus zines versus um, coffee table books versus exhibition catalogs. Mm -hmm. My mind just has pros and cons for all of them, really. But they're all way more accessible than an original piece of artwork would be for the majority of the population. Mm -hmm. I'm already picturing mm -hmm. like your your edition of 200 published books, but each one is still wrapped individually. <laughs> like they have to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think just like one note about accessibility too and kind of in that connection is and like being a printmaker, making multiples is that kind of everyone that I interview for this project then gets a print in return. Right. Um, kind of this vision of building this like far larger archive, you know, anyone who donates a photo would then get one of those for Shiki in return. Like I think kind mm -hmm. of that connecting with the community has been so important for me. Um, and so then like Erica, I wanna ask you kind of how has, how has that community embraced the work or reacted and engaged with that work like thinking of like 
How would your dad feel about this one? Mm. How does your family feel about it? What mm. like, and how do you feel when you're presenting to different communities? Mm. Thank you for asking that. Um, it's this is this is stuff I think about a lot. Um, I I have been trying to find a place for this the 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 aircraft carrier guys the flight deck guys um, that are in the McCall show and that landfall piece and the series I'm developing there I really want that work to be um, to be at, at different military museums where people are going to immerse themselves in the, in the cultural objects and stories of um, yeah of our armed forces and because I, I, those people are also my audience and in some ways mm -hmm. they can be a more important audience perhaps than the folks that end up at galleries. Um, and I, yeah, I, I want that work to be, to be there, to be with them. I'm actually thinking about getting in touch with um, the, the carrier that my dad served on was uh, operational from 1946 to 1991, which is a really long, long period of time. Um, and they have annual reunions, annual or semi-annual every two years. Anyway, you know, I would like for an exhibition to cor correspond with those reunions um, and to get together with some of those guys who I'm in touch with um, fairly regularly. Uh, that hasn't, yeah, that hasn't really happened yet, but I have these great interactions with, with people who see the work at times and do have some kind of firsthand experience with, you know, let's say one of the, one of the jets used in the work or a, a, a rocket engine, or um, they recognize something that they've worked with, a piece of machinery, like a tractor or a um, that they've used themselves and the way that we're able to engage and the way they see themselves and their, you know, and their predecessors and their heritage kind of playing out in that work um, has been really gratifying, really, really gratifying um, because they're also grappling with, with those residues and with the implications of, of being involved and connected mm -hmm. to, um, yeah, to, to resource extraction and, and, settler colonialism and the military industrial complex. It, I realized that I had to, and I'll, I'll be brief with this because um, I had a question for you too, Emma, <laughs> um, was the, I realized the logical extension of my, these lithographic posters was putting this work out in rural areas. Like not the, not the posters, for example, but doing a version of of these posters on the broadsides of barns. Like I wanted to do murals on barns because I want, um, I want those conversations to happen more often. Um, and I, I'm making work for people like folks in towns I grew up in. Um, and, and I think what happens in rural areas is really important, really important to think about, really important to acknowledge, really important to problematize and criticize and be involved with, whether it's, you know, making food or, or extracting shale gas. Like this is, this is the critical stuff of our future. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping for a lot more of that and, and it, continuing to ask that question, how can I get this work um, in front of people who are intimately engaged with these things? And how can I get myself um, in conversation with those folks more often too? Are you familiar with um, Fiona Banner? I, that doesn't sound familiar. She melted down two fighter jets to their pure ingot form and stacked them in the gallery space. And I would just love to see that shown with your work. Um, she had it shown um, at the Tate Britain quite a few years ago, for example. But I'm just thinking of the, the possibilities that could happen there. That is incredible and actually crosses off a project that I wanted to do from my list because it's a little too close. It's, uh, <laughs> okay. Good to know. Good to know. No, it's, I could do something. I could, yeah. There's so much you can do with casting. It's, of course, of course. It's cultural print. We, mm. We've got roughly five more minutes if you did have a question for Emma. Um, I do, but actually, um, we'll be totally honest. It was really just... Uh, <laughs> No, noticing a huge contrast again between the two of us in this 
really awful way that I don't know if I can, uh, I don't know if I could fit that in in five minutes. <laughs> but let me try. I, I, the way that you are respectful of these stories that, that have been shared with you and your sense of, um, of moral responsibility and care and respect for these people and um, not just their stories, but who, yeah, who they are, who, how they developed in this world through that, through that time in their lives is nothing at all like how I use and source mm -hmm. material, unless it's the words of, of veterans um, or civilians who've been harmed by, um, by my military particularly that I'm, that I'm very careful around, but otherwise, like, I feel like anything is fair game when it comes to, um, when it comes to some of the words of say, Lyndon Johnson, for example, or Robert McNamara, these people who like dragged my, dragged my nation and my, my parents' generation um, into this disgusting clusterfuck of a war. I will, I will use their words as much as I like. I will paraphrase. I will take them out of context. I will distort and pervert for the purpose of, of my work. And I think that's a really, same with, same with images too, though for the most part, I, like it's, it's all public. It's all fairly public. Um, but there are some historic artworks that I'll sometimes riff off of sometimes too. But I feel like that's, that's this history that I have grown into that is mine for better or for worse, but um, but it's I'm definitely going to take disrupts. liberties. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Art that disrupts become so vital and important, especially, mm -hmm. well, not just now, but also so long ago as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I think I was so excited to be paired with you for so many reasons, but I think the, like the work is about so many of the same things, but looks so different and the way we're kind of tackling different ideas and implications of it and repercussions is, mm. um, you know, we're kind of in these same circles. So it's just really interesting to hear you really speak about it and kind of all of those ideas. And, mm. um, and this is the beauty of art of how different it comes out. Um, and also then how <laughs> the different conversations that start happening of like, when the work is more confrontational, what starts to happen? Like, what is, what, what's the conversation there? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think, I don't know, like at the root, I feel like both of us just want to create these spaces for conversation. Um, and, yes. and that's the amazing thing of, you know, being able to create this work and inviting people in. Mm -hmm. um, and providing that jumping off point. I mean, I just kind of, when you were talking and I'm mindful of time, talking about washing mat, watching mash with your dad and then kind of those chats that would follow. Um, and kind of I've had a few opportunities to sit down with different folks and look through photo albums mm -hmm. and kind of how helpful it is to have those prompts to start telling those stories. Mm -hmm. Um, and then thinking that our work can become those prompts. Um, mm -hmm. And that way in is, is such a wonderful thing. I knew this was going to be a good talk. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking forward to it very much. Um, thank you very much, you two, for first of all, being in the exhibition, agreeing to be in the exhibition, and for giving us an hour of your time this evening. Um, we have your, your socials up for everyone who needs to go check out your websites, your Instagrams. There were too many photos that I wanted to include in all these slides. So please make sure you spend a little bit of time and, um, and go there. Mm. Last but not least, I've got to do a little thank you to everyone, all the artists, all eight artists who were in the exhibition. Um, flawless rock stars. Um, I was lucky enough to kind of say, okay, I want my students to see this work from these artists. Let's get them in here. So that was the, one of the primary motivators behind this exhibition. Um, so that's all. All four of these talks are available on um, the brand new app. And there's the way you can download it right there, that QR code. It'll be on Facebook and YouTube probably within five minutes as soon as I click the little end button. And mm -hmm. our exhibition comes down on Friday, December 15th. So you still have a little bit of time 
to go and check it out. Um, Erica and Emma, thank you again very much. Always a pleasure. And I hope you have a great evening. Thank you, you Miles. Too. Thank, thank you, you, thank you Emma. Thank you so much. You All right. Great night, everyone. <laughs>